on this Wednesday night, a blockade between New Brunswick and Nova Scotia cleared. Traffic on the Trans-Canada gets moving again, the protesters and the police presence. There's the Delta variant, and now there's Delta Plus. How much more menacing is this mutation? Under the microscope, the likely link between the Pfizer and Moderna shots and a rare heart condition in young people coming back from COVID. To know that he is home is miraculous. The man who defied death and his doctors. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin in Atlantic Canada, where a last-minute change to border reopening rules reached a flashpoint on the Trans-Canada Highway, and police moved in not long ago to intervene. For more than 17 hours, protesters blocked the highway at the New Brunswick-Nova Scotia border. People had thought today would be the day they could finally travel freely across that border, but... Just hours before reopening, Nova Scotia Premier Ian Rankin pivoted, saying travelers from New Brunswick would still have to self-isolate if they cross into his province. Rankin says the decision was made because New Brunswick has opened up to the rest of Canada, and his province is not ready to take that risk. We need a lot more second doses out. Uh, I think that it's a reasonable plan to just wait for that week. Uh, June 30th, New Brunswick will be... Uh, back in the bubble is the plan, uh, no more self-isolation, no, no testing requirements, uh, but we need that extra week. Well, not long ago, police moved in to clear the blockade on the highway. They're detaining protesters who resist. Our Ross Lord is there. Ross, what's happening now? Well, Donna, right now there's a long line of RCMP officers and a line of protesters across from them. A uh, little while ago, the police presence here increased in terms of the number of vehicles. After that, uh, they informed the crowd that it was, uh, in their words, an unlawful assembly and that they would have to leave the highway. So the vehicles that were barricading, blockading the highway in each direction here at the border are gone now. Uh, some of the protesters have dispersed as well. Others are still here. Uh, some have been uh, detained, uh, those who refuse to move back after the uh, Mounties instructed them to do so. So it looks like the blockade itself uh, at this point is over. Uh, we don't know yet if this is the end to this uprising, which began because people here, especially near this border, were upset over Nova Scotia's new COVID-19 rules. That doctor in a U-Haul is not going to work. The blockade is a surprise that followed a surprise. Protesters say they were blindsided when Nova Scotia decided people entering from New Brunswick would still be subject to vaccination and isolation rules while loosening restrictions for those coming from PEI and Newfoundland and Labrador. We want the borders open, we want the guards gone, and we want to move freely to see friends, family, visit our cottages. Nova Scotia Premier Ian Rankin says his reasoning is simple. There is more risk from New Brunswick because it allows people from anywhere in Canada to travel there freely. Rankin urges patience. I respect their decision to go faster, and, and I would just ask for respect for, for our decision to take it more cautiously. Protesters say they've waited long enough. My children and my grandson are in Moncton, 30 minutes away, and I haven't seen them since October. And um, I, I need to see them. My mental health is, is not at a good place. The uprising was organized via Facebook. Its promoters included the opposition MLA for the Nova Scotia side of the border, who demanded Premier Rankin ease the restrictions. And if you don't, the Trans-Canada Highway will be shut down. Deciding which vehicles to let through has at times caused friction, even between protesters. Other protesters intervened along with RCMP officers. Some truckers were stranded at the border all night. Protesters say they allowed health care workers to cross, although officials at the nearby regional hospital say five nurses and three respiratory therapists did not make it to work, forcing the hospital to provide essential services only. For the Atlantic provinces, which have been praised for cooperating so well during the pandemic, this is a, a turnabout and not a good one. The premiers of the four provinces had a snap meeting to try to sort out some sort of compromise, a way to get the traffic moving again while finding a set of rules that they could all agree on. Donna?
right, Ross Lord on the Trans-Canada between Nova Scotia and New Brunswick tonight. Thanks. Now to the pandemic, Canada still leads the world in administering first doses of COVID-19 vaccine. More than 66% of Canadians have received at least one shot. Over 21% are now fully vaccinated. And today, the medical health officer for Peel Region in Ontario had a message for anyone who got a dose of Pfizer first and are now being offered Moderna as a second dose. His advice? Do not refuse it. That's the equivalent of saying that you won't fly with an airline because it's not your preferred airline that has seats off in an island that is sinking. You'd rather wait for the next available seat on your preferred airline, which could be weeks away. Dr. Lowe says an mRNA vaccine is an mRNA vaccine and people should take whatever they are offered first. Well, Canada is on track to have the majority of people fully vaccinated before the end of summer. And the pressure keeps mounting on the federal government to set out clear guidelines about what we can and cannot do. Mike Lecatur reports. I don't know what the, the road looks like after dose two. Luke Ireland got his first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine Wednesday and is already looking forward to his second. But few people at this clinic know what fully vaccinated life will look like. But do you have an idea of what you can do after you get that second dose? Uh, well, at the moment, that's a good question. Susan Lindsay's 16-year-old son just got his first dose, and everyone in the family is anxious to hear what they can and can't do once they have both doses. Nothing is going to change that significantly until the government actually mandates what you're allowed and can't yeah. do. Manitoba's top doctor was even asked if fully vaccinated people could hug each other outdoors at a barbecue. And while he said it should be safe, Dr. Brent Rusin admitted there is a lack of Canada-wide guidance. We're working at, uh, at sort of with, uh, with all the national colleagues to start coming out with uh, specific advice on those scenarios. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control had that kind of specific advice 41 days ago, saying fully vaccinated people can go into each other's homes without a mask. Some doctors worry a lack of rules for fully vaccinated Canadians could lead to more problems. If we don't have guidance, there'll be a large number of people who are forging their own rules or doing their own way, and it might not be safe. And this is why it's important for us to uh, give, uh, give guidance for the, for the population. Canada's top doctor says the Delta variant and local case counts mean it's not a black and white decision. We would like to uh, enable people to um, take themselves through uh, that kind of risk assessment while respecting local public health requirements. This epidemiologist says it's tough to strike that balance. This is a struggle between our liberal democratic individualistic perspectives and the need to uh, to enact communal good and the two have been in, in tension for the last 15 months. And that is likely to continue until more people are vaccinated and more restrictions are removed. Michael Couture, Global News, Ottawa. The European Union wants its member nations to speed up vaccination efforts. Its Center for Disease Prevention and Control warns the Delta variant is on track to account for 90% of all COVID-19 cases in Europe by the end of August. It has already spread to 23 European countries. Studies show two vaccine doses offer the best protection, but only about 29% of EU residents are fully vaccinated. You have heard a lot about the Delta variant, and now there's some evidence emerging about Delta Plus, a mutation that has been declared a variant of concern in India. Scientists are keeping a close eye on it because there is some limited evidence that it could be even more transmissible than the original Delta variant. Redmond Shannon explains what we know and don't know about it. This Himalayan trek is part of India's ramped up vaccine program. Millions of shots now administered every day as it continues to struggle with infections believed to be driven by the Delta variant. And now India's health ministry is telling state governments it has found 40 cases of a Delta mutation, Delta Plus. India is classifying it as a variant of concern, possibly more transmissible and more resistant to a particular COVID-19 treatment. The index cases of these uh, Delta Plus variant should be monitored very closely. 
The Delta Plus variant is a mutation of the spike protein on the virus called K417N. It was also found on the beta and gamma variants, which first appeared in South Africa and Brazil. The Delta Plus mutation was first reported by public health authorities here in England earlier this month. The first known case was taken from a sample in India in April at the start of its brutal second wave. Many experts say it's too early to say if this mutation is a greater threat than Delta alone. It's not always like 2 plus 2 is 4. In case of viruses, it's not like that. Virologist Levin Abrahamian says it's encouraging that this mutation does not appear to have dominated the original. We still don't have it so many in Europe and, and the United States and, and Canada. So that makes me think that it's not so bad as Delta by itself. Or oh, it's not at least uh, worse than, uh, than Delta. Experts say many more cases need to be analysed before we know if it affects transmissibility, disease severity, treatments or vaccine effectiveness. Well, I would be you know, really surprised if in the next week, a couple of weeks, we don't get more information. Fewer than 200 cases have been identified outside of India, including at least one in Canada. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. There's more information tonight on reports of heart inflammation among young people who have had the Pfizer or Moderna mRNA vaccines. The American Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has been investigating for months and today said there is a likely link, though cases are very rare. The conditions are known as myocarditis, an inflammation of the heart muscle, and pericarditis, which is an inflammation of the layers of tissue surrounding the heart. The CDC says early data shows the conditions are most common in people aged 12 to 29, mostly among young men and adolescent boys after the second dose of an mRNA vaccine. Some incidents have also been reported after the first dose. More than 1,200 cases have been identified in the U.S. That works out to a rate of 12.6 cases per 1 million second doses. Most cases were mild with symptoms like fatigue, chest pain and disturbances in heart rhythm that quickly cleared up. The CDC says the benefits of immunization far outweigh the risks of these rare side effects and that heart inflammation can also occur when young people get COVID-19. Extreme heat and dry conditions are already challenging firefighting crews in Alberta. A wildfire west of Edmonton is out of control and people in a nearby town had to flee their homes. Temperatures in Alberta and B.C. are forecast to break records in the days ahead. Lauren Pullen reports on the fires raging now and the fears of what's to come. Fierce winds fanning suffocating smoke and flames burning right outside their back door. Well, it was scary. George and Norma Hishka had mere minutes to grab whatever they could and get out. The next thing we know, a peace officer drove in, lights flashing, <laughs> said you guys have to leave. More than two dozen families were forced to flee the flames of an out-of-control wildfire that sparked an hour west of Edmonton Tuesday. The 180-hectare fire is threatening homes, but luckily, everyone who's fled them is safe. People are tense, uh, you know, with the dry weather we're having right now, and people are nervous. That anxiety is only increasing as Canada's western provinces dry out and heat up, with a major heat dome set to descend upon B.C., packing a record-breaking punch. We could be breaking daytime high records, but also all-time records for the entire month of June. The B.C. interior is already seeing scorching hot temperatures. Days from now, it's expected they will climb well into the 40s. And around Vancouver and the B.C. lower mainland. We are seeing a rapid drying of the forest right now, and that is obviously going to be a concern. That punishing weather is expected to move into Alberta in the coming days. We're in for a, quite a heat wave that's going to impact most of the province. So we're expecting fire danger to increase um, in the upcoming days. Providing little relief in the wildfire fight, but crews are confident they're ready for whatever comes, with more resources available if and when they're needed. Still, for now, these homeowners can only wait and worry. We're just praying that nothing happens. While crews throw all their efforts at getting the fires under control. Lauren Pullen, Global News, Calgary. The fight to free Britney Spears. She can't even buy Starbucks. She can't even drive her own car. Coming up, fans unite as the pop star tells a courtroom she wants her life back. Plus, the sudden death of an antivirus software pioneer.
We're here to give support to Brittany. We want her to use her voice to end this conservatorship once and for all. The rules are just ridiculous. It's, it, it, changes need to be made, and I'm here fighting for my girl. Britney Spears supporters were outside a Los Angeles courthouse as the pop star testified she is traumatized and wants her life back. It's her first public testimony about the 13-year conservatorship that she's been living under. She said her father, Jamie Spears, should not be in control of her life and that she feels enslaved by him. She told court, I've lied and told the world I'm okay and I'm happy. It's a lie. I've been in denial. I'm in shock. I am traumatized. All I want is to own my money and for this to end. Her father was appointed a co-conservator after his daughter went through a mental health crisis in 2008. Spears told court that control extends to her body, that she's not allowed to have more children, get married, or even remove her IUD. Her legal team says today was about putting Spears' wishes into the public record. The next steps will be helping her gain more control over her life. John McAfee, the entrepreneur who created antivirus software, has been found dead in a jail cell in Barcelona. The Catalan Justice Department says prison medics tried to resuscitate him and that everything indicates McAfee took his own life. A Spanish court had just authorized his extradition to the U.S., where the 75-year-old was charged with tax evasion. McAfee developed the first commercial antivirus software and sold his stake in the company for more than $7 billion. He was arrested in Spain last October trying to board a flight to Turkey, accused of failing to file tax returns for four years, despite earning millions doing consulting work. Getting sticky with pitchers, the drama around baseball's attempt to get a grip on cheating just ahead. A sticky situation gripping Major League Baseball is causing quite the stir. They have increased scrutiny for pitchers as far as sticky substances on their person. Umpires are now checking pitchers for any hidden sticky foreign substances that could provide a competitive edge by giving them a better grip on the baseball. He was a, a little bit heated there after the performance as he's immediately thrown off the belt, the glove, the hat. Yeah, the pitchers aren't loving it. It's led to some awkward scenes on the field. The league says pitchers found using foreign substances will be ejected from the game and automatically suspended. Beating the odds. Next, one COVID-19 survivor's remarkable story. Since the first days of the pandemic, healthcare professionals have seen it all. Too often, the sickest of COVID-19 patients could not be saved. This next story, though, is about a man who was an exception. He was one of the most critically ill COVID patients admitted to an Ontario hospital. His family was told to prepare for the worst. As Mike Drolet reports, he surprised everyone, including his doctors. Months after collapsing in his driveway, the odds were stacked against Jamie Vargas taking a leisurely stroll with his wife ever again. How it all played out is still a blur. He remembers snippets, the ambulance and x-ray machine, and the doctor telling him COVID positive. The day he came to the hospital on March 24th, he was the sickest person we probably ever had in our emergency department who ended up surviving. The 53-year-old was put into an induced coma almost right away. His oxygen levels were so low, he had to be intubated, which led to pneumonia and eventually collapsed lungs. It was only when he awoke 50 days later that he learned COVID protocols had prevented his wife, Yolanda in December from seeing him in person. It was hard. Like, the day she told me what, when, when I was better, and she told me what, what was said and what was going on, like, it was hard. Hard? Yeah. And when doctors told Yolande she needed to say goodbye to Jamie, she did the unthinkable and flat out refused. They told me yes, I said no. They're like, I'm of course this, the wife who, I'm in, I'm, I believe in positive thinking. So I'm like, it's not gonna happen, it's not gonna happen, it's not gonna happen, it's not gonna happen. Refuse to accept that it's a possibility that this could happen. Jamie is now focused on getting his strength back. And while he's no longer in hospital, he's not far from the thoughts of those who cared for him. COVID-19 has left so many in healthcare feeling drained and deflated. Jamie's story is something of a booster shot. To know that he actually is home uh, 
is miraculous, I think, to us. For this COVID survivor, the miracle is a renewed positivity in life and another walk with Yolande. Mike Drolet, Global News, Toronto. And that's Global National for this Wednesday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Your Canada is a couple of moose exploring Calgary's Mackenzie Lake. One took a dip in the lake, and, and why not, really? The place belongs to them. Besides snacking on some gardens, residents say the wild visitors were well behaved. Love to jump in that lake myself. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you here again tomorrow. Take care of yourselves. Bye bye.